Hello. Um, good evening. I'm, I'm Yann Lebeau from the School of Education and Lifelong Learning here um, at the University of East Anglia. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to uh, this British Academy lecture uh, taking place um, in partnership with us, the University of East Anglia, tonight. I'm also welcoming um, our audience online, um, joining us uh, via the YouTube uh, channel. So the British Academy um, is the UK's uh, National Academy of the Humanities and Social Sciences. It mobilizes these disciplines to understand the world and shape uh, a brighter future. Um, established in 1908, um, the Academy's flagship lecture series showcases the very best scholarship in the humanities and the social sciences. Um, today's lecture is delivered uh, by a fellow of the British Academy, Professor Anna Vignols. Um, Anna Vignols is director of the Leverhulme Trust, one of the largest research founders in the UK, funders in the UK, um, an education economist and previously a professor at the University of Cambridge. Um, her research focuses on the relationship between educational achievement and social mobility and the role played by skills in the economy. She has been a trustee of the Nuffield Foundation and a member of the Council of the Economic and Social Research uh, Council, ESRC. She was elected to the British Academy in um, 2017. I'm delighted to hand over to Anna to deliver her 40 minute lecture and after which we will have 15 minutes of uh, questions and answers. Uh, this lecture, as I've said in introduction, is uh, being recorded and streamed and there will be opportunities for our audience uh, online to also ask questions after your lecture. So, Anna, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that kind in invitation to come and talk to, at UEA. I've, I've been here a few times, and it's a, a real pleasure to be back here. Um, it seems like this is quite a good day to talk about investing in education, given what we heard today in the budget that isn't a budget. Um, a little bit stressful, because obviously anything I might have prepared could be out of date, but turns out that I can uh, more or less predict what the Chancellor is going to do. Um, and I'm going to try and make the case to you uh, that we need to think about education as an investment. Um, I know that might seem a somewhat controversial idea to some and obvious to others, but as I go through, I'm basically going to make the argument that I think we undervalue education uh, considerably, and when we do measure education, we often measure the wrong things. So, just to get started, um, why do we undervalue education? So, as educationalists, it's obvious, I think, to all of us uh, that education has immense value, intrinsically, clearly. It has value because it helps us navigate the world, it has value because it helps us participate in society, it helps us learn other things. All of these things, perhaps to us, go without saying. But it's also the case that education has always been a social endeavor. It is not just for the benefit of the individual, it's a public good. Uh, the benefit of edu education certainly goes beyond the individual. And that's why I think the concept of investment is so important when it comes to thinking about education because we need to think more carefully about what it does, not just for the person acquiring it, but others. Right, so I'm going to talk about the undervaluing part, then I'm going to talk a little bit about overmeasuring it, which is another, another topic altogether, and then hopefully come back at the end and give some solutions. So what, what do I mean by undervalue? I think that we undervalue education because we see it, or at least the state sees it, as expenditure and not as investment. And that might seem a little odd to some of you. Uh, those of us working in education are constantly thinking about outcomes for students. And a lot of the time, those outcomes are around good jobs, wages. So you might say, no, no, actually, we've been thinking about education as an investment for a very long time. But I would argue that although we talk about that and we often measure the outcomes from education in terms of jobs and wages, actually, when it comes to what the state does, um, it doesn't treat education as an investment in the way that it should. And I would give you the evidence here when we talk about uh, productivity and the need for economic growth. 
we have entire debates about productivity and economic growth that pretty much stop at the concept of, yes, of course, education is important. Yes, of course, skills are important. The connection, the real connection in investment terms between the skills and the education system and what it does for the wider economy is often left rather implicit. Now, obviously, as an economist of education, we have a well-known theory, uh, human capital theory, uh, developed by Gary Becker, that sets out why we think education is an investment from a, a, an economist standpoint. It's a very simple idea, I won't dwell on it. Education gives you a range of knowledge and skills, I think we'd all agree with that. But what it also does is it tends to make you more productive in the labor market. And because you're pro more productive, uh, you tend to earn more. And as a result of not only your own productivity being greater, because of education, but hopefully also helping others around you become more productive, you end up with uh, more rapid economic growth off the back of investing in education. Um, I think the evidence that uh, education, skills, human capital, if you will, uh, is causally uh, linked to being more productive and uh, being, uh, having higher earnings and higher economic growth is very convincing. But it is true that it's hard to measure human capital. It's a tricky thing. Not all schooling gives you the same in terms of skills, obviously, and therefore not all schooling has the same value in the labor market. But the principle is well established. Um, the other thing I think it's important to note is that just investing in education isn't enough to create economic growth, of course. There's a lot of work being done at the Productivity Institute, for example, um, uh, which is funded by ESRC, trying to understand UK's rather dismal productivity. Now, you need a whole range of things for a, a productive economy, including investment in physical capital, et cetera. Um, but you certainly need investment in people, in education and skills. That has to be a necessary, if not sufficient, condition. And the thing I would like to stress above all else is that we have repeatedly over the last six months to a year, hail, heard about the importance of R&D for the UK, for the UK as a, as a country and the UK as, a, as an economy. We've also heard about the importance of R&D for addressing many of the challenges, not the economic ones, the real challenges around climate change, et cetera. So this is a, a core part, not just of our economy, but of our society. And yet you'd be surprised how difficult it is when you're in a room talking about the need for a really thriving R&D system, and you want to talk about the shortage of physics teachers or the shortage of maths teachers. Uh, I often get a nod at that point and a sort of slightly confused look. Of course, people would get the connection, but they don't really get the connection. And I would argue, if you have a workforce in the early years or a workforce in primary schools, secondary schools, that is not thriving, if you're not able to retain uh, or recruit, retain, and give them good opportunities to do the very best they can, you're not going to have that thriving R&D system at the end of it because you've got you know, weaker links in that chain. And I think that's a really important thing for us to recognize. The other thing is that even if some of you are sitting there thinking, yes, but economic growth has major downsides, we'll come back to that, um, we worry about education and skills for distributional reasons, right? If education and skills grow alongside technological innovation, it is possible, as, as Golden and Katz elegantly put in their papers, you can have more equal uh, growth. You can have narrowing wage gaps because essentially you're seeing technology and skills move together. If, on the other hand, technology races ahead, but you're not keeping up in terms of education and skills, you will get widening gaps the more skilled people go off and get ever higher salaries, uh, other people get pushed out by the technology and end up in low wage occupations. And those gaps really matter, again, not just from an economic perspective, but from a societal perspective. But I think the biggest challenge we have when we try to make the case that education is an investment is the last point. Education might have a high return. Indeed, it does have a high return. I'll show you in a minute. But it's also a very long-term investment. So we're asking people to make decisions today about investing in our schools or our higher education systems, and the gains are many years hence. In some cases, I'm gonna talk about early years, it's a generation away, and that is a really hard thing to do politically. 
So if there were policymakers in the audience, I don't know if there are, um, we want numbers, right? Or they want numbers. They would like to see the economic benefits of education uh, set out clearly to make that case for investing in education. Um, and I've done a lot of work on this. Um, and I did think of showing it all to you. And then I thought, no, I'm not going to show you a whole bunch of numbers because actually all those numbers are pretty much saying the same thing regardless, almost regardless, of context, sometimes even regardless of country or the phase of education you're talking about. Pretty much every study shows a positive return from most types of education investment. It varies. Yes, it varies by field of study, for example. Um, I've done work with Jack Britton and colleagues, uh, some of you might be familiar with, uh, looking at the returns to different degrees. Uh, and it's certainly true that not every degree gives you the same labor market return. But on average, we're seeing high returns relative to, say, putting it in the bank from investments in education. And I think we should sort of take a step back and think about the enormity of that because we've had a massive expansion of our education system, right? We've got a much higher proportion of people going on to higher education. Well, the laws of supply and demand might suggest that actually, you know, the return to, to those degrees will become zero or negative. In some cases, for some specific degrees, that has happened. But overall, we're still looking at a positive return. And I think that's an illustration of the, the demand that's there. The other thing that's really evident from the literature, whether it's Steve McIntosh and Morris's paper or Cavagli et al., all of them are showing, you know, returns to basic skills, returns to intermediate skills, again, varying by subject, but they're there. And I think we must be really clear that when we're talking about education investment, we're not just talking about investment in higher education, we're talking about investment in education all the way through. So we might, I think, want to take a rather broader view of what investment in education actually looks like. It's more than just acquiring the skills for the job. Uh, it's about benefits for the individual, like health, but it's also about benefits that go beyond the individual. For example, there's a, a nice paper looking at levels of civic participation, which are higher with education. We could probably do with more civic participation. This is a good thing. And so what we need to think about is drawing on this growing field of more and more robust studies showing the non-pecuniary benefits of, in, of education, the non-pecuniary benefits both for the individual, say in terms of their health or other aspects of their life, but also uh, going beyond the individual to the social. And the other thing I think we fail to sometimes do is articulate that some of the apparently non-pecuniary benefits of education actually have quite major economic implications. So if education does improve your health or your mental health, um, that obviously has cost implications for the state. Now, we do need to be careful in our enthusiasm here. Not all education has a positive impact on every outcome that we can think about. And actually, some of the relationship between education and well-being is a lot more complicated than that. But there is a now a nice body of work suggesting that we can look at a range of outcomes. Uh, and there's a great paper by Oriolopis and Salvanis that shows causal impacts from education on health, marriage, parenting, patience, uh, reluctance to, to get engaged in risky behaviors, trust, and social interactions. These are all great outcomes with lots of wider social benefits. And so my point here is that yes, we need to think of education as an investment, but a broader investment. So my second proposition really here is that um, if we establish or we like to think about education as an investment, uh, we also undervalue it when, when you look at the evidence. Um, and I'd argue that we undervalue it in three ways. If we saw it as an investment, we'd be a little bit more reluctant to let it decline per pupil, for example, over time uh, when we hit hard times. And certainly we'd be reluctant to cut. Uh, and in fairness, the budget today appears to have not cut school spending, but I'll come back to that later. The other thing we tend to do is if we're faced with uh, uh, you know, constraints, as one always is in public spending, uh, we often cut in the wrong places. So we don't value the bits of the system equally and in the way that we should. And then the third point, I think, is something that's being missed a lot at the moment is that we fail to realize that education is only one uh, of the aspects of a child's life. So to get a child from childhood 
through to adulthood, particularly in difficult circumstances, actually requires a range of connected public services. And what happens is if some bits of that system start to fail, it has implications. And I think this is something that has frustrated policymakers. Uh, in fairness, school spending was one of the more protected areas, for example, after the Great Recession. Uh, so that's a good thing. And yet outcomes have still worsened, uh, and particularly widening of a socioeconomic gap. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that you can't just focus on one bit of the system and ignore failures in the rest. So just to put some numbers in on it, on it um, we're not the worst in terms of our spending per pupil in the school phase, um, but there's no doubt about it that we've had a big decline over the last decade, well, actually since 2008. Now, the 2019 and 2021 spending reviews were trying to restore uh, funding levels to some degree, but I think there are two problems here. I mean, one, inflation is eroding all of those intentions anyway. But also, I think that the cuts hide the fact that the schools have had to do more over the last decade because of what's happening outside the schools in terms of economic conditions that children are growing up in. So schools, if you like, have had to do more work uh, and faced with this uh, decline in real resource. It's become increasingly difficult. And that's before you get into the argument I've just made about bits of other public services being cut and, and putting strains on schools. So getting into the sort of technology of schooling, there are some other aspects about schooling that make it special and perhaps different from some of the other public services. Um, education is very much a cumulative process. So again, it's fine and great that we protected school spending post-2008, but of course, other bits, particularly in some of the early years and then later uh, um, in the 16 to 18 phase, there were much more dramatic cuts. So the last slide suggested a, a, a cut in school spending of 9%. So the cuts in, in, say, the 16 to 18 phase were nearer 25%. So we've had this period uh, where, we've, where we've got big problems in terms of funding. Um, but the, why, why is education so cumulative? Why can we not just put more money into one bit of the system? It's probably obvious to most people here, either working in education or who have children, but uh, children uh, require inputs uh, you know, throughout their life. And the thing that's really striking when you look at the data is that the gaps in achievement between poor and rich students really emerge very early indeed. And so clearly, if you're not able to get to children and help them and support them at a very early age, by the time they start school, those gaps are embedded. And um, I will show that in a sec, actually. The, the other point about what we know about children are, is that there are critical periods of their development. Uh, for example, early years language, uh, adolescence, peer relations, as Sarah Jane Blakemore has shown. And we've seen this in the pandemic. You can't just take out a little bit of a child's life or schooling or have a period of time where there isn't much resource dedicated to that period and expect to sail on through. But the big issue here is uh, the different experiences of different types of children. And I think this uh, picture, which is from work by uh, Alyssa Goodman and Paul Gregg, um, it's an old picture, but it's the best way of illustrating what we're talking about here, I think. So what they've done is they've combined various data sets. So think of this as a, a sort of a, a hypothetical child across the x-axis from age 3, 5, 7, 11 onwards. And what you're looking at is the test score gap between those who come from the most advantaged households, the top fifth, which is the blue line at the top, and those who come from the poorest households, the bottom fifth, which is the orange line at the bottom. And you can see my point here that by age three, those gaps are considerable. And I'm using the term test score, but obviously we can debate what test scores at age three look like. But the point being is on the measures of development and achievement appropriate to age, there are these massive socioeconomic gaps. And they widen through the school system pretty much until you get into secondary, at which point they're fairly embedded. And this graph is why if we're determined to help the children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, protecting spending, say, roughly between the ages of seven and it was 15, is not really going to be enough because it's a cumulative process. So we also cut in the, long, in the wrong places. Um, I've you know, made the point here that 
the one thing that educationalists, psychologists, sociologists, economists all agree on is that the structural barriers that kids face, particularly child poverty, are major drivers of pupil achievement. So whatever's going on in the school system, we have to really be aware that what's going on outside the school system matters a great deal. And the resourcing that we can put into children matter more, obviously, for those disadvantaged pupils. More advantaged pupils find other ways around it, or their parents do. And because of this, the system is actually it's a positive aspect of the English education system, and indeed the UK education system, is that spending is progressive. But again, that's got worse. So this is a picture uh, from some work I was involved in with Christine Farkson at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and other colleagues, including Sandra McNally. And what this picture is showing is the ratio of spending, in this case in primary, uh, for poorer students relative to richer students. So if you look at the peak, for example, in the, let's see if this works. No, you'll have to imagine the peak or see the peak. Um, the peak in uh, the late 2012-ish uh, um, shows uh, that the pupils in the most deprived quintile, which is actually, remember the line at the top here, uh, of the population being funded at a level about 1.35 times the level of pupils in the bottom quintile. And you can see over time that declining. So this is an issue. We're becoming less progressive in our school spending. And it's not a coincidence that during this period, we've also seen a widening of the socioeconomic gap, probably best illustrated by last year's GCSEs. So where do we cut or where do we worry about cutting? One of the things I've talked about is this, this idea that you have to intervene early. And just to be clear, it's not a question of intervening early and then not at all after that. It's, it's that you need to start early might be a better way of putting it. So if we're concerned particularly with students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, we might want to start quite early and we might want to target those students pretty hard. And that's what we did. But that targeting has got much less over time. Um, now, this is, a, this is an interesting area to think about it because it in, illustrates challenges in the education policy space because we have competing policy objectives here. On the one hand, we want affordable childcare to support people who want to return to work. But on the other hand, from a sort of child development, we need targeted intensive early years programs to help the most disadvantaged children. The Sure Start program being an example of that that was cut back quite drastically. And that kind of quality of provision and that targeted early years support is not childcare. It doesn't look like childcare. It's a lot more expensive than childcare. And so I think what we have in this space is, is a bit of a conundrum. On the one hand, the childcare aspect is important because we want people to go to work and, and that might help families with, with income issues, obviously. But equally, we need to target to help the neediest children. And I guess, you know, obviously one answer is zero to five high quality provision for all. Right? That's a great investment that we could make in the next generation. But in the absence of that, I think we've got some hard choices here about targeting versus universal. So the other area uh, is teaching. So one of the challenges I'm sure people who work in education will recognize this is everybody would ideally like, sorry about the phrase, a silver bullet, right? If only we did X, it's going to solve this problem. And that X can be anything from the latest psychological approach, the latest pedagogy, the latest intervention, the latest way to organize our school system, academies, etc. Those things make remarkably di little difference in and of themselves to pupil achievement, not as individual interventions. The nearest we get to a silver bullet, I would say, is teachers and teaching. Because the one thing we know from the evidence that makes a big difference to pupils' achievement is not so much which school they go to, but which teacher they have. So teaching quality really, really does make a difference. And I put references at the bottom. I mean, I can give you lots and lots of numbers on this. But you know, teaching quality is, is more, arguably more achievable, stroke affordable than reducing class sizes and will make more difference. Um, it's certainly going to have a bigger impact than any amount of worrying about whether you've got an academy or a, or a, uh, a community school. So it really, really matters. And the interesting thing about teaching quality is it matters more for lower income students. So that is, a, is 
what I would say a silver bullet because it's the one intervention that we know could really help the most disadvantaged children. So this is what we need to be focused on. The other bit of evidence that's pretty uh, compelling uh, is that very inexperienced teachers, new teachers, are on average less effective. It's not a criticism, it's just they're learning what is a difficult trade. So these findings should really guide policy. Teachers are important, teaching quality is important, and very inexperienced teachers are marginally less so. So what have we done? Well, we've let the pay of teachers decline uh, quite considerably over time, as you can see from the slide. Um, does that matter? Well, it matters because it's also the case that there's a question about whether teaching is an attractive profession. Teaching has a higher turnover rate than many industries. Um, the latest data I was looking at from TeacherTap, which is a, an app-based teacher survey of some repute, suggests that around 30% of teachers don't intend to be in the profession in three years' time. And certainly international studies like TALIS suggest that we have younger teachers because they've been in the less profession for less time and we have higher turnover. Not turnover between schools, turnover out of the profession. Now the government has recognized this problem. They've uh, suggested uh, an increase uh, in teacher pay, very welcome. But uh, Luke Sibieta and other colleagues who are looking at school finances have questioned how this will be funded because there isn't a lot of more money in schools to pay for the pay increase. Well, it'll be funded the only way you can in a people business where 80% of your costs are teachers by reducing teacher numbers, possibly teaching assistant numbers as well, more definitely. Now, if pupil-teacher ratios are going up and if that causes more workload problems, your attempt to help by uh, increasing pay, I mean, it needs to be done, there's no doubt about it. We need to restore some of that pay loss but it's not going to be the answer that policymakers might expect if other things are, are driving teachers out of the profession, such as greater pupil-teacher ratios. And so the final bit I'd like to sort of emphasise on the cutting aspect of it is the fact that we protected school funding, but once again, the largest declines in funding that we saw were in further education. So for context, you know, 40% of the cohort go on through to the academic route, ending up doing a degree. The rest, or perhaps maybe nearer 50%, end up in an FE college at some point, doing a wide range of qualifications. FE colleges are complicated places. They offer complex qualifications. So these cuts in resources have a major, major impact on them. And the other thing I would note, and this is not unrelated to the fact that this is an ignored sector, is that poorer students are more likely to go through FE. And I think that is directly connected to how much time, energy, and investment there is in this sector. Now, don't get me wrong, there have been umpteen reviews, lots and lots of description and talk of the need to invest more in FE, and indeed the need to reform our vocational qualification system. Um, I've been doing this too long because I've seen a lot of reviews and a lot of words that look the same. But actually, when it comes down to it, in terms of investment, we had a recession, this bit got cut far more than other bits, and I think that speaks volumes. And the other thing I would say is that if we're worrying about teachers, teachers in FE get paid less, and we should worry about them just as much in terms of pay and job quality as teachers in secondary. Um, I said that if there's underinvestment in education, that's an issue, but if there's underinvestment in wider public services, that's also an issue. Um, I think We've really seen quite a lot of this recently. And talking to colleagues working in those sectors, particularly post-pandemic, there's a sense that the wider situation, the wider inequalities that we're seeing in the economy are coming into the classroom and into uh, uh, the nurseries. And it's making the job that much harder. And it's quite invisible because the kids are still attending nursery and schools. But what's going on under the hood is that actually schools are seeing more issues that they need to deal with. And many of these are not going to be captured simply by measuring outcomes. But nonetheless, measuring outcomes we do. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a sec. But uh, the outcomes from all of this are, are reluctance to really see education as an investment and the cuts that we make in some of the wrong places is that we, we have outcomes that remain very unequal. Um, I just want to show you this very brief picture, but you could look at a range of outcomes and you'd say see the same pattern. 
These are the highest qualifications people achieve by the age of 26. And the bar on the left-hand side is for the entire cohort, as it says. Um, and you can see around about a third go on to do a degree. Now contrast that to the next bar, which is kids from the most deprived quintile of the distribution, only around 17% going on to a degree. Um, the final bar shows the success rate in terms of degrees for uh, children who went to private schools, and as you can see, at 71%. And I think this, in a nutshell, sums up where we are in terms of inequality. And that matters in and of itself, quite apart from the lost talent and other ways in which this might be impacting on our economy. And I think this became really obvious when the pandemic hit. Um, it was really interesting to watch the other functions of our education system become much more visible to people, right? The childcare element, the care element, the fact that lots of children at risk get picked up in schools, etc. Some of these issues really got flushed out um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and I was involved in an initiative called DELVE, uh, organized by the Royal Society. And funnily enough, it was funded by the Leverhulme Trust, but before I was even knew the job existed. Um, and it was Gordon Marshall, my predecessor, who funded this. But it was a, an amazing experience working with multidisciplinary teams, trying to feed information into SAGE about what was happening in the education system. And I mean, none of these findings should come as a surprise to us. Uh, and if you want to go and look at the latest data, Richard Blundell and colleagues have a really nice paper trying to summarize all this, and it's in the references. But in a nutshell, COVID didn't impact on everyone. Like other bits of our system, what happened was it, it impacted on those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds to a much greater extent. And so we see this widening of gap between rich and poor. So we already had a problem going into COVID and it laid bare that problem and exacerbated it. And it's not just uh, in terms of sort of test scores or education achievement, it's also in terms of mental and physical health. So what have we done about it? Um, and I guess this concludes my laboring the point about underinvestment. So we have spent three billion, or rather we've made three billion available for a national tutoring program. Apparently not all of it's been able to be used. Um, that equates to about 300 pounds per pupil. Uh, the Netherlands, the US spent already a thousand pounds per pupil and some countries much more. So certainly it's the view of Sir Kevin Collins who was put in charge of, of briefly, very briefly before he resigned, uh, the education recovery after the pandemic, and he just thought it was insufficient. And I think that kind of sums it up. So is there a risk here? Um, if we talk about education all the time as an investment, does it narrow our definition of what a good education looks like? Is there a danger here that basically, if we're just talking about sort of wages as outcomes and jobs as outcomes, what happens if education, uh, you know, a particular course or a particular subject doesn't give you wage benefits, doesn't give you employment benefits? Does that mean that that particular subject is not valuable? Well, clearly not, um, clearly not. Um, but I don't see how we take a long view about investing in the next generation without acknowledging it's an investment. And I think what we really need to do is think about the returns from that investment as being much broader than just simply wages, but uh, spreading across a range of outcomes. And it's, an, it's a useful concept to try to convince people that the spending now is gonna make a difference down the line. So, one of the challenges that we will have, of course, if we're talking about education as an investment, is, is proving it. But before I get onto that, I think we have another issue with our education system, which is highly related to that. If we could agree that education is a valuable thing, we should spend more on it, and we would like to see a wider range of outcomes measured, then clearly we need an accountability system and a monitoring system that can convince the taxpayer that you know, money has been spent wisely. So I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have monitoring or accountability at all. However, I do think that the UK is particularly unique. We really, really like to measure our public services. Um, we, we definitely have been, uh, if you can put it this way, at the vanguard of developing metrics-based uh, accountability systems. 
And, and it's not just that we measure it, it's that we link those metrics to money, right? So the metrics drive the parents or the patient behavior, they choose the school or the hospital, and then that in turn leads to higher income for the school that attracts more students. So we have set up this system, um, and in a sense, you know, those metrics are one way that we could measure the effectiveness of our system. Right? But we do more than that. We add a layer of extra accountability on top of those metrics. Uh, and that, I, by that I mean institutions such as Ofsted or for the Office of, uh, for Students. So I would argue we probably have one of the most intensively measured education systems in the world. And we should really stop and ask whether that's making a positive impact and how we might do it better. Just because you measure something doesn't improve it. Obviously, everybody knows that. And certainly, when it comes to the metrics-based approach, uh, having very high-stakes metrics in our education system has undoubtedly led to gaming. So one of the first things we tended to do, or still do, is measure a very narrow range of outcomes. And naturally, schools being measured in terms of maths and English will focus on maths and English, often uh, at the expense of other subjects. Um, but we also uh, set sort of targets, such as five A stars to C, and then we get surprised when schools target students around that boundary because that's what they're being held accountable for, rather ignoring students who are at the very bottom or the very top. So we've known about these problems, and I actually think we've made a lot of progress in improving those metrics. But where we've made very little progress is widening uh, the basket of measures. And if there are any teachers in the room, I can hear the sigh of, oh no, not please, not more measures. But bear with me. It, the, the broader set of measures should not be about necessarily holding an individual school accountable for an individual outcome. It's about giving us a clear sight of the system as a whole and what it's doing in terms of a broader set of outcomes. And we can do that using administrative data. So you can link pupils' education to their use of health services, to their use of public services more generally. You can link it through to all sorts of outcomes, which would give us a much better line of sight on the real genuine impact of spending on uh, education. That can be quite distinct from the specific use of metrics to, to drive school behavior. But the other thing is that, you know, one might argue that Ofsted or similar is there partly to bring in that breadth, right? So you have the, the metrics that are focused on GCSEs or key stage two test scores, they're quite narrow. Maybe it's the role of Ofsted to, to go broader than that and think about a wider set of outcomes. Well, possibly, um, but it's a very expensive system. And as any school leader, I think, would acknowledge, schools are spending a lot of time and effort focusing on what Ofsted either wants or they believe they want. Um, and that's just another type of gaming in reality. And when we think about the time and effort going into accountability systems in the UK education system, I think it is a legitimate question to ask whether we could do it better. And that's definitely in the context of a high teacher workload. The data that I referred to earlier about high teacher turnover, our inability to recruit and retain, and the fact that only one in 10 teachers thinks that Ofsted is a reliable indicator of quality, according to Teacher Tap. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we don't have any measurement at all. Um, clearly, there needs to be some accountability in the system. But we need to think about that in terms of costs and benefits. But I think the big thing, and Jan and I were discussing this earlier, the big issue with any accountability system, whether it's for higher education or schools, is we have to recognize that education is not done to a child or a young person. It's a joint activity, right? It's a, a joint process, a joint effort between the student, the parents, the community, the school, or the college. And because of what I've said about the economic circumstances of children mattering so much in terms of their achievement, this has a, a, has a consequence that you cannot hold the schools entirely responsible for every specific outcome for that child because it's this joint activity, this joint effort, 
and because of what's happening outside the school. And even our value-added measures don't really fully take this into account. So I've said we don't value education enough uh, and that we overmeasure it to some degree. Um, I'm just going to end with my last few minutes by talking about what I think we might do about it. Um, this might be a little bit of a game of two halves of what we would do about it in the ideal world that we would like to create, and then I'll end with a, okay, this is what we might be able to do about it. Okay, so I would argue really strongly that if we start to talk about and treat education as an investment, uh, we can start to make a better case than we've done hitherto about the need for long-term investment. Um, and I think now is the moment we, we are, as a country, are, are facing big questions about uh, economic growth, improving productivity, et cetera. Now is the time to get into that conversation. But I think it's really important that when we do, we're not just talking about wages and jobs. We're talking about wider outcomes. And we've seen enough during the last five years to know that those wider social outcomes are pretty crucial to the way that the UK will be going forward. But we're also talking about the whole workforce, not just the top end, not just those going for the degree or very top of the R&D uh, pipeline. And the other thing I think we need to acknowledge as educators, because this isn't all down on the government's plate, is that whatever route people are taking through our education system, and however passionately we care about our individual subjects and just the love of the subject and the learning in and of itself, all of that is obviously hugely important. But our young people want and need a breadth of skills when they leave so that they can cope, not just with a more complicated labor market, but actually with a more complicated world and with some serious challenges uh, that they will have to navigate. And I think you know, there are clear arguments that we might want to take a look at some of the curricula and some of the things that we do with children to, and young people to, to get that breadth in there. And we can come back to curriculum reform later. I think the other thing we need to do is recognize this issue that education is cumulative, and this is very straightforward, right? It's a sustained investment. When you're making decisions about what to do on public spending for education, it should not be possible to make a decision about one tiny little bit of the sector without thinking about what investment looks like over the entire life course of a person, or at least until the end of full-time education, ideally including lifelong learning, I would argue. And the thing about that is skills beget skills. So if we invest early, our investments later are likely to be more effective. And certainly every part of the system matters. I've said repeatedly that the structural barriers that some children face in their homes, particularly economic disadvantage, drive a lot of what we see. And so obviously, if we did nothing with the school system at all. We left it exactly as it is with the seven level of funding, but managed to reduce the number of kids living in very economically disadvantaged households. We are likely to see improvements in their outcomes. So obviously that should be a strategy for the country to pursue. But we also need to recognize that um, that's a very difficult thing to do. And we can't just wait for it to happen. The targeted programs that we need in the interim mean that we've got some difficult choices to make between uh, you know, well-supported universal services versus targeting those who are most in need. And that's a really difficult thing, both economically and politically, to deliver. But imagine the world where we haven't really convinced people that you're going to make investment that goes over a person's lifetime and that we haven't convinced them that one of our priorities should be to reduce the number of children living in poverty. Imagine that we are just where we are, which is in a difficult situation with limited resources. What should we do over the next few years? So we need to stop doing things that take time, energy, and resource that we don't think is going to make any difference. For example, fussing around with school structures is really unlikely to make a big difference to people's achievement. We need to focus on the things that we know can make a difference, such as teachers, practitioners, uh, do what we can to improve recruitment and retention, and if we can't pay more, paying closer attention to the quality of that job might, might be one way that we get some traction there. If we have limited resource, and if I said nothing else, I'd want to say this today, which is you've got to do less, and you've got to do it differently. Right? You can't just keep going as we are going and say schools need to do everything they did yesterday, it's just that we've got marginally less resource.
And this is a, t a difficulty. It's a difficulty for the government who want more better outcomes on the same resource. It's a difficulty for us who are either teaching teachers or in the education system. We don't like getting rid of things, but we're going to have to if the resources are very scarce. And I think one way we need to do that is think about measuring the things we really care about and working to work out what bit of we're, we're, what we're doing really makes a difference to that wider set of outcomes and really focusing on them. And then in terms of uh, accountability systems, if we have to do less and have to do it differently and we're trying to strip out things in a more resource-constrained environment, it is obvious that we're going to have to take a good hard look at our accountability system, not to eliminate it, not to, to just walk away and say we don't need any, but to work out the benefit-cost balance and uh, try to reduce the, the, the cost of that particular system. So I will stop there. Uh, I wouldn't say that was a positive note to end on, but I hope it's a practical <laughs> note to end on. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. And perfect timing. Um, we will now open um, the, um, the discussion to, to the audience. So um, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand and wait for one of the microphone handlers to, uh, to arrive. Um, also, those of you joining online, uh, please use the chat function, um, and your question will be read out at some point. So. Um, Time now for question. Um, we've got our handlers um, on both sides of the of the room. Yes, please, Pauline. Thank you so much, Anna. Pauline Rose, the University of Cambridge. Um, such striking data, and as you know, I work on related issues, but more in international development context, so in Africa uh, in particular, and Sonia and I have done some analysis that I think really sort of similar in terms of the types of messages that you've got there for the UK. It seems like some of it's a no-brainer in terms of, well, this is obviously what policy, how policy needs to respond, but policy doesn't seem to necessarily respond in that way. So for example, in the settings that I'm familiar with, um, it's only around 1% of funding, public funding, that's going to early childhood education, to pre-primary school, for example. And yet, the evidence in these settings, similar to the evidence in the UK, are very striking in terms of if you invest in those early years, it has a massive effect on um, future outcomes in those wider um, terms that you're saying. So I just be, I know that you've worked a lot with policymakers. How, how do you convince policymakers? How do we actually use this evidence in ways that can make a difference? Or um, are we as frustrated internationally as we are in the UK? I, I, well, I guess I think equally frustrated. I mean, I think there are two aspects to this. So education spending is a political act. So it would be naive to suggest that you can take all decisions about education out of the political system and put them on one side. But we tried to do that with the Bank of England, right? And, and there is a temptation to think that if you could set up an institution that was slightly arm's length, which tried to plan across a system, as opposed to leaving bits of the education system sitting in entirely different government departments in this country for many years, right? Um, that's got to be one step to making more joined up decisions. But you mentioned early childhood, and I think that's really interesting. Because actually, um, you know, it is not the case that the UK government has completely walked away from spending in early childhood, actually far from it. But it's very interesting what happens when you have these competing priorities. Um, I'm sure anybody with children, and particularly children under two in the room, probably feels uh, that the priority for government should be affordable childcare, right? But that affordable childcare, particularly for people in work, isn't going to be targeted at the poorest families. So that's a discussion. And when you get into a tension between two competing groups, one of which is much more likely to have a voice, you know the outcome. And I guess this is why some of the Scandinavian countries have the sweet spot of actually trying to go for universal, where you don't get those tensions. But from where we're sitting in the UK, that feels rather like utopia. <laughs> 
So I don't have any answers. But we could try for a Bank of England equivalent for education. Or at least maybe in another country we could try for that. <laughs> Hello. Um, I don't know whether this is actually a question or more of an observation based on some of the things that you've kind of said. I'm a social worker and um, I have noticed since I qualified that we've lost all of the, you know, the Shore Start centres, the kind of community hubs um, and a lot of what I would sit formerly have seen as a social care role now falls sort of onto schools. I don't know whether this is across the UK or whether this is specific to Norfolk, but we sort of rely on schools now or schools are kind of asked to lead plans that are essentially related to kind of social care issues, so early help assessment plans. Um, lots of schools, you know, their safeguarding leads are teachers and they're having to teach as well as kind of essentially do a social work role. Um, and I think that I, I kind of see the strain kind of that is falling on to kind of all of these schools. We've got schools who give children showers and buy their uniforms and we ask them to go and knock on doors when police can't do that if we're worried about the safety of children and they're just taking on sort of a huge amount of what is essentially health, social care, police role because schools are there and their, their resources are, are so limited and they're doing more and more and I think it was the, the thing that you said about do less, you know, um, and, and I just think who is advocating for for schools in terms of saying, look, we can't carry on kind of doing this, um, because I think that's a huge amount of the stuff that's causing teachers to want to leave the profession, because they're not in schools teaching, they're doing social work and, you know, health visiting and police work and, and everything that, that falls onto schools who are just sort of there to do it. And I just wondered, is anyone saying, you know, this this can't continue, what are the alternatives? Uh, are policy makers kind of discussing that to move away from this kind of huge responsibility that we're sort of leaving schools to deal with? Absolutely, I mean, you've said it all really. Um, it's not just Norfolk um, and it's not just post pandemic. So uh, schools have both implicitly been asked to do more for example, when children's mental health services get overwhelmed, uh, the children are still in school. So there is still some authority interacting with that child. It tends to be the school. But they're obviously largely ill-equipped to deal with that, certainly without backup support from professional mental health services. And this is uh, the report we did for SAGE. You know, it, a lot of that was documenting pre-pandemic problems with uh, say mental health services is an example and the inequalities in that but also just the, the problems of accessing that kind of support. So uh, it's definitely not just Norfolk and uh, I think it's also not just the implicit burdens that are going on schools that might not be visible, it's explicitly often being asked to do things which actually when you stop and think about the resource and the training that teachers get you might wonder why it is that you think that delivering particular you know, interventions in schools is really going to be effective. And absolutely, if we're going to do less and do it differently, those are the kinds of conversations that we need to have. I think the other thing that's hard for people who don't actually uh, go into schools uh, you know, or talking to colleagues who work in special educational needs, it's quite hard to visualise the way in which some families have been so negatively impacted by the economic circumstances and what that looks like in a child's life. And, uh, you know chaos, aggression, hunger, th these things have really big impacts. And, and when the child walks through the school door, it doesn't stop. Um, and I think we need to get people to, to appreciate that. Sally Shuttleworth, University of Oxford. I agree with virtually everything you said, um, and certainly the notion of investment being measured across a, a broader range. But I was pondering, because you started off with economic well, or value for the labor market, and we're obviously in a, a point at the moment where across the world, humanities, for example, are being hugely undervalued. And I'm just wondering how, when you argue politically, 
you, you argue for in, in investment terms, but how do you persuade governments that actually you don't go for the easy measurement of how much you're going to earn, but the other measures of the effects upon health, et, et cetera? Um, because it's quite a complex argument for those who merely want to measure according to an easy metric of earnings. Yes, so just to be clear, my argument is, is that if we just say it, it shouldn't be about jobs and wages, we're not going to get the investment we need, and that's the, the, you know, the premise of my lecture, is we do have to think about it as investment. Um, actually measuring those broader outcomes isn't as hard as people think. We have amazing data. ESRC is invested in uh, the Administrative Data Research Center. We can link some of this stuff up and look at those wider outcomes and look at those humanity graduates working in different creative industries or working in the health service in various ways. So there's, that, that's much less of an issue. Um, what we need to do is agree what those broad range of outcomes might look like. And nurses and doctors are, are the example that people often go to, right? I mean, nurses, you know, their salaries don't re, re, you know, reflect the value to society, and we all know that. And there are many more examples like that. And that means you've got to measure the value that they do add to society in some other way in order to get a clearer picture. But I would also add that I think, um, personally, from what I can see in the data and from asking students, students themselves value labor market outcomes from their education. And so as educators, I do think it's important that we look hard at what we're doing in our courses and our degrees and our vocational qualifications to try and give students uh, as broad a range of skills as possible that they can do well in the labor market. So I don't think we can completely say, oh, well, it doesn't matter you know, what wages are from a particular degree, for example, because that's not how students would think about it. Um, so I think there's a bit of running on both sides to do that. Um, and yes, it is a difficult argument, and it's very easy to say, well, we can't, you know, we don't want that nuance. And I appreciate with the government, sometimes it's hard to express nuance. But I think in the long term, it's the way we actually start to value some of those wider outcomes from education. Um, we've got to make the case. Thank you, um, Anna. Um, I know we've got other questions in, in the room, but we're going to uh, just pause for a second because I would like to take some questions from the audience uh, online as well. So uh, let's just pick up one or two questions from, from the chat. Uh, somebody said, so you mentioned teacher quality is one of the most potentially transformative factors in education. Uh, I think this has been known for some time, but it seems that the quality of a teacher is a difficult thing to pin down. How do we identify quality teaching? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, there's a simple answer to it, which you can sort of see it in, in measuring um, uh, test scores. But as I've just said, you, you know, that doesn't capture the fact that not all contexts are the same and some pupils come in with much lower, uh, well, not just lower levels of prior achievement, but additional barriers. Um, what you need to do is be in a scenario where you have sufficient numbers of people wanting to be in teaching uh, that you don't have a recruitment and a retention issue. And at that stage, just as in pretty much every other industry, most managers and head teachers and everything can identify good teachers. Um, and it's not as hard as people think, I think, to, to recognize a teacher that's making a major contribution. Uh, it's very hard to do anything about it if you can't recruit and retain. And also, we need to be much clearer that teaching is a profession, a profession and investment is needed. And most teachers can improve you know, with various forms of CPD and other things. And that is another type of additional investment that we would need to make. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've got one question in the middle, one on the front row here as well, and one over there. And I think that will have to be the end because we are approaching the end of, um, of the session. So brief question if possible, so that we can squeeze those three if possible. Uh, so I'm uh, Eugenia Calvert. I'm a, a living from Early Career Fellow here at UA, and uh, I'm just thinking about this uh, metaphor of, of education as an investment. And uh, one thing that strikes me from uh, your presentation is that if you make this metaphor, then you have to kind of extend it and think of it as uh, not just an investment, but as a, as a, well, I guess, shareholding, some kind of uh, a system where education and parents, among other things. Uh, co-invest. So when you think of lower income households needing so much more investment from the state uh, compared to high income households, uh, 
what you're really th saying is that educated people invest or co-invest with the state in their children's education. So, which leads me to two questions. One is, um, isn't one way of thinking of, about this is as a growth area. Uh, longitudinally, once you invest in the child's education, that child grows up, invests in their child's education, and therefore the state invests less in the next generation. So in that sense, economically, you're creating your own co-investors. That's one kind of one, and what can be done in that logic, within that logic. And similarly, what can be done today uh, in terms of enabling co-investors of the state, the parents, to do more with less, to kind of to, to make that investment judiciously. Uh, so in that, again, in that scheme, wouldn't mean that the state can do a lot working with parents, giving them, uh, I don't know, something, subsidies, I don't know what, what, is, what, what, what the best way would be to approach that, but how can you enable co-investment most yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, there are two aspects to that. I mean, the first aspect, you're right about the intergenerational um, transmission. I mean, going back to Sally's question about outcomes. I mean, the paper we did suggesting that basic skills of parents impact extremely positively on the basic skills of children. And so some of the things that we're doing in our education system are about sort of cascading benefits down through the generations. And therefore, you have fewer problems at the end of it all because of that. Uh, the co-investment model is a very tricky question. Because, I mean, one could argue that, you know, uh, tax credits for investment in education, uh, you know, would, would, would get you there in the sense that it would encourage parents to make co-investment. But obviously, it would also be deeply regressive because only richer parents could afford to make the co-investment. I think when we, I talked about the fact that it's a joint production process, what we actually need to do is get better at helping parents help their children within the context of a state school. And some very difficult questions about expectations and how much parents expect, how much they can get, and how you do less or do it differently and still keep everybody happy. Uh, and actually, I think that's the kind of co-investment model I was thinking about. Thank you, uh, Anna. If okay with you, we're going to take the last two uh, questions or comments together, and then you can, okay? So um, I think you've been waiting for a long time. There's a microphone coming your way, and then we've got, um, yep, a question at the at my name is James Prentice. Um, at the end of a career in business, I came into teaching for a while. And I find it a very bewildering experience in the sense that coming from business, you look around, you think, why on earth do they do it like this? And one of the things that strikes me is that you have a huge amount of data in education, and it's used very much at a high level, input and output. At the same time, there seems to be very little... Uh, good data available on what works and what doesn't work in a classroom. Now, if English education was a, a business organization, there would be trials going on all over the place into ideas that are convincingly that they might lead to improvement. And those ideas would then be rolled out um, in a structured manner across all schools, and, and th there would be this process of improvement, but I can't see data being used in that manner. Am I mistaken? Did you, you wanted to take two questions? Or yes, I? I would, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I've made a note. Yeah. I would definitely answer that question. <laughs> uh, so, Andy Jordan, um, University of East Anglia. It actually follows on from the previous question. I would like you to connect the first of your points and the second of your points i.e., why is it that we undervalue and und or why politicians undervalue and under-resource whilst at the same time over-measuring, over-tinkering and over-assessing? So, so that's a big question. <laughs> uh, yes? No, no, that's not the answer. Um, okay, so starting with your question about data... Yes, we've got data on the system. And in fact, there's a lot of work, for example, done by the Education Endowment Foundation, trying to work out what works, where what works is defined as uh, an intervention that leads to higher pupil test scores. But I think actually what you're talking about, which is absolutely right, is the organization and the management and the running of schools, the internal processes by which they operate, and whether or not some schools can do that far more effectively, efficiently, whatever, than others, and how you would share that practice. 
And if we're serious about saying, okay, well, what are we going to do less of and what are we going to do differently? Clearly, we need to look to models where they're sustainable, where they're not churning out their staff, you know, driving them out because the workload's too high, et cetera, and actually try and, and understand what they're doing and have a sort of grown-up discussion about all the things that schools do because they see it as necessary, or indeed what universities do because we see it as necessary from a regulatory perspective, but that we genuinely don't think is having a positive impact on pupil outcomes, and we need to try and strip some of that out. Um, and I guess that speaks to, to your question as well. They go together because if you think that education and health are the two big ticket items that policymakers have to spend on, the desire to control that spend and to make sure it's giving you value for money is huge. And it's, it's, that's not a sentiment that we should necessarily criticize. The taxpayer, I guess, does have the right to, to think that the money is used wisely. But I think the UK in particular, might not apply to other countries, has the most centralized systems probably ever, uh, particularly in education. So trying to do that from Whitehall and, you know, as we saw in the pandemic, trying to manage that number of schools essentially from Whitehall is almost destined to give you problems, difficulties in delivery, high costs and quite a few other things. But I think that's where some of that tension comes from. Thank you. Um, many thanks to, uh, to Anna for this very inspiring uh, lecture and for bringing all these important debates about the value and valuation of education to, to UEA. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you to the audience um, on site and online for, for joining us tonight and for asking the question for your contributions. Um, if you would like uh, to find out more um, about the British Academy and future events, uh, you can visit the website and you can actually uh, sign up to receive updates on future events. Uh, of this type at other universities. And um, if you've made it to UEA uh, today to attend this uh, lecture on site, uh, you're welcome to join us uh, for a drink uh, in the foyer just behind. Thank you very much, everyone. And once again, thank you to Anna.